Thanks, Dan, for making our vacations much, much easier. I think we've been using your site since at least five years on our annual family vacations in Maui. So it's, it's a really great service that actually whoever hasn't tried it yet. Um, but I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about the transition or the transformations that Singapore Post has been going through. Um, and also tell you a little bit more about the e-commerce business um, that we've set up uh, since about three years ago. So a little bit more background about Singapore Post. So we're a 150-year-old company. We have our roots in the mail business. And if anybody can imagine, you know, if you're in the mail business, not really a very exciting space to be in. You know, Mail, mail is kind of rapidly disappearing, and even before people talked, uh, started talking about digital disruption, you know, email hit that uh, hit us more than 10 years ago. So to add, to add a little bit to the pressure, so Singapore Post was privatized in 2003 and listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange, um, and obviously no investor would ever want to invest in a business model that's dying. So um, the, the, the leadership back then had to uh, think very hard and transform or diversify the business uh, quite actively. And they've been fairly successful in that. So the, the first, um, first new business line was financial services, where we have remittance services, um, home loans, insurance products, but mostly just for the Singapore market. Um, the second one then was logistics. So setting up a logistics network kind of like a small version of a DHL or FedEx, um, just with a focus of Asia Pacific. And then last but not least, e-commerce, so that's the ones that I'm talking to you about now. So if you're a postal operator, you know, not, not the easiest thing to transform into an e-commerce business. So when we started, um, pretty much three years ago, actually next week, and three, uh, next week um, we, we turned three years old, uh, we looked at what are the key essential components to actually run an e-commerce business. You know, obviously you need to have an e-commerce platform you need to be able to drive traffic to an e-commerce site, otherwise nobody will find it. Uh, you need to have customer service, especially across Southeast Asia and um, the northern part of Asia Pacific. So if, if you're in um, Hong Kong, usually people actually start making a call or chat before they place an order, same thing in China. Um, you need to have warehousing and fulfillment. You've seen Adrian talk about that a little earlier on. You need to be able to effectively get the product to the consumer and also handle returns. And you actually need to have products. You need to have something compelling to sell, otherwise nobody's gonna buy on your site. And then preferably you wanna hold all of this together um, via very, very good operations so that it's actually enabling a good customer experience. So when we started out, obviously Singer Proposed didn't have anything on e-commerce technology. Performance marketing was non-existent. Customer Cure, we actually had a little bit of something. You know, we served a lot of consumers in the region already. A warehousing fulfillment was one of the few things is that we were actually very strong in. So we've been serving traditional catalog suppliers or catalog distributors, you know, like a Reader's Digest in Australia um, since more than a decade. So we've had a lot of experience in pick and pack operations from that perspective. Delivery returns was also one thing that we were very strong in, especially in Singapore, Australia, um, Japan, and a couple of other markets. And merchandising and store management, Literally, there wasn't anything there because we didn't really sell anything besides stamps and logistics services. So, um, when, how, how do you start um, when you have a lot of gaps in the business model? So, first thing we did um, is we looked at the people. So, we, we hired a very, very strong e-commerce team um, in Singapore, San Francisco, and India. When we looked at the, the previous old SingPost office, it looked more like out of the movie Office Space. You might remember that thing in the basement, like really horrible. Um, so nobody would ever wanted to move into that office. So we had to set, set up a, actually a separate legal entity um, and a separate office location from the traditional mail business. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we started with the team. You know, but we didn't quite know then which business model in e-commerce would actually work. You know, you've seen um, the, the, <clears throat> the presentation from Zalora, uh, you've seen Adrian, you've seen a couple other guys talk about e-commerce business models. You know, when we started out, well, what would actually work in Southeast Asia? And as I mentioned, we started about three years ago. Um, so the first thing we started was a luxury and fashion site. And you know, surprisingly, it actually worked pretty well. So we started selling Hermes bags for $80,000 um, and a lot of other products. And you know, there, there were enough consumers that would actually buy these. So I was actually surprised. But um, the big challenge for us is was actually competing with the logistics business. You know, we've had a lot of e smaller e-commerce players that were using our delivery services. And it's like, well, you, you guys might use our customer data um, and then use those for your own businesses. So probably not a good idea. So we were fortunate enough to sell that business. Um, then we started the marketplace. Um, so we, we, and that was before um, Lazada, Rakuten, and all of these players came into Southeast Asia. Uh, we didn't really have the budgets um, to, to spend a lot of money on marketing. So that was a rather challenging proposition for our investors uh, to go forward. 
What we did, however, discover um, is that we had a lot of brands talk to us that wanted to warehouse with us, but they didn't even have an e-commerce site. So the first one uh, that we actually talked to was Adidas. Um, they had a program running in Germany um, that was fairly successful in, in the US, and they wanted to expand that to Asia. Uh, but they didn't have the resources or manpower in-house to do that. So we started becoming an e-commerce enabler which wouldn't compete with existing customers and complement the services that uh, Singer Proposed was already offering. So as a result, um, we set up an e-commerce platform for Adidas um, all across Southeast Asia, literally across every country. So if you go to, uh, to shop.adidas.com.my, um, you are on a site that's run uh, by our team. Um, the call center is run by us, the e-commerce site is run by us, payment fraud, literally everything is run by us. And we started that, so with the, this site went live in April 2014, so that was our first bigger site. And by now, we have about slightly more as than a thousand customers um, on the platform. So to give you a little bit of overview, um, we've just been named by Forrester Research as one of two uh, leading e-commerce enablers um, across Asia Pacific. The other one's uh, Baozun, that's only covering China, so we cover um, all the rest of it. Um, we now have more than a thousand clients. We have 24 logistics centers um, across the region, all the way from New Zealand uh, to Japan and Korea in the north and pretty much everywhere in the middle. We have four call centers to cover all the languages. Uh, main location is in the Philippines, um, but also in Chennai and uh, Dalian in China. Um, and since we started the transformation of Singapore Post, that was about a little more than three years ago now, we've doubled the market cap during that time. And we now have a lot of very, very big brands um, that are actually using the platform. I mentioned Adidas. You know, if you go to the Uniqlo site here, uniqlo.com here in Singapore, uh, here in Malaysia, you'll see that we run that too. Um, and <coughs> you should test it out. Hopefully you get your packages very, very quickly. Um, if, if you look at our markets, you know, maybe that's slightly different from, from what Paul presented earlier. Malaysia is actually a very strong market for us. You know, one of the benefits that we see in Malaysia is that the, the retail footprint is really uh, kind of concentrating on here the, the, the KL, Kling Valley area, a little bit Penang, a little bit JB. Um, but we get a lot of transactions from the eastern part of Malaysia, you know, Kota Baru, but also from Kota Kinabalu. So, um, fairly far apart. So we, we see very, very similar trends that I think Adrian mentioned earlier. In, in, in Malaysia, about 75% of all the transactions on all the brands are actually from places where there isn't a strong retail network. So I don't necessarily agree that there is a cannibalization uh, with the offline retail network, at least not yet, um, and probably not in, in Malaysia. The other benefits that I see in Malaysia is that the um, logistics network is actually fairly sophisticated. Um, so we own parts of, of GDAC and we work very closely with them, and that works very well for us. Um, and the, the payments networks are also working very well. So what, what we see is a lot, of, a lot of our brands, or a lot of the <coughs> consumers pay with CIMB clicks, um, Maybank to you, um, and these are fairly sophisticated. Even credit card penetration isn't as low um, as, for example, in Indonesia or some of the other Southeast Asian markets. So we actually are, are fairly bullish about Malaysia, and we serve fairly good growth there. Um, our biggest, mar biggest markets, however, are actually Australia, Korea, Japan um, and Hong Kong and you know if you're if you're a brand in in the US you know you don't think of I want to go to Malaysia um, that's not really how an e-commerce head in the US works or, or thinks you know they think okay I want to go to Asia um, and I want to see that I can cover as many countries as possible you know they, they don't have the time to spend um, an hour a day or even 15 minutes a day worrying about one specific country. So it's absolutely essential that we can cover um, more than one or that we can really cover all of Asia Pacific because that's what actually customers asked us to do. And to, to, to our big surprise, you know, we've, we started out with Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and the next thing that customers ask us about is Korea. Um, and Korea was something that uh, we totally underestimated. You know, in, in the first dot com bust um, in the early 2000s, you know, the, a, lot, a lot of e-commerce business or a lot of brands already had a setup in Japan. Um, after that, they stopped investing, so they missed out on Korea. Um, so Korea was, was doing much, much better than we expected, uh, just because a lot of the brands, even though the market there is, 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 is already very advanced, um, it just didn't have uh, the, the offer of, of a branded e-commerce site there. Um, a couple other things that we started investing a little more. Oh, forgot the slide here. So this is kind of the, the, the value proposition. So you know we, we take care of everything from e-commerce on the e-commerce technology, um, an omni-channel integration, 
And I know that that's very hard to do, so we only do that for brands that have very, very good data. Um, but we have a couple of very good examples of that, um, so you can ask me offline about that if you want more details about that. Payment and fraud is a very big topic um, across Southeast Asia. So if, if you go, for example, to the Philippines, uh, fraud rates are extremely high. Um, if uh, you, for example, go to Vietnam, and I just spoke to a former colleague of mine uh, that's uh, running the Apple site um, in the US. They had to shut down uh, Vietnam because the, the, the fraud rates were just too high. So fraud is actually a very, very big challenge. Um, store operations, so this is making sure that we upload the product catalogs that usually come from an SAP system out of a global setup. Um, performance marketing, so driving traffic to the site. Um, creative production. Creative production is the, is the photography. So this is probably not as scalable, where the, for the first items here are rather scalable. Uh, photo production you know, is, a, is a rather manual product sort of uh, process, so scalability isn't as high. Um, delivery and returns, so this is feeding our logistics network, uh, warehousing, regional customer care, and in some cases, even legal entities. So for example, if you're a brand that wants to sell in Indonesia, um, you know, you're not allowed to set up your own e-commerce entity there, so that's a restricted business. So we have a JV there, um, with one of the big corporations that distribute phones um, that allows us to have a legal entity and with that legal entity that we can leverage, though this legal entity can be leveraged by, by our clients. We usually launch sites within three months or less um, and we do that by working very closely with, uh, with our team in San Francisco that we're then works with the brands there um, and we have a very small setup in, in Europe too. Um, and we also complement marketplaces so you know a lot of brands want to have their own customer experience so they don't want to have uh, competition uh, you know from potentially other brands on the same marketplace um, <coughs> so uh, but they still want to sell some of their end of season products so we can feed the same products uh, that they give that they warehouse with us um, obviously then also to marketplaces. The other interesting thing from an investment perspective is that we're pretty much gross margin positive across all the services. Some of them are less scalable. Some of the less scalable are definitely ones that, that involve a lot of manual labor, which is the call center um, and uh, creative production. Um, the, the other thing we've we focused a lot on, and I mentioned that earlier, is technology. You know, I think on the technology side, there's two very important things for any business. You know, the, the absolute most important thing is scalability. And I'll show you a little graphic graph uh, from, from last year. Um, so this, every, every hump is a, is, is a day. This is this number of people that come to one, one brand that we run. And you know, then you have spikes, in, in this case, um, ar around Black Friday. So this was um, a, a, um, a site in Australia. Um, and then you see these huge spikes here um, last November weekend. Um, and you know, if, if your IT systems can't handle that, uptime is absolutely most critical thing uh, for any e-commerce brand. If your site is down, you get a lot of big, bad press. Um, I was working for HP before, and you know, we always had trouble keeping the site up during for Super Bowl ads uh, would usually crash us. You know, that would give us more bad press than anything else. So uptime is the absolute most essential thing there. And I think the good thing is, you know, with, with Amazon Web Services, you know, that's, that became a little easier. Uh, the second most important thing is security. You know, any, any brand that trusts you to run their business, they want to be absolutely sure that you treat their customer data properly. So they do very, very detailed uh, security analysis on your business and site. Um, so security is probably the next important thing. Um, features probably only come after that. Uh, so if you can't make sure that your site is absolutely stable and scalable, um, you know, then you're probably going to be dead. And the second thing is security. Um, and on the, on the scalability, there's a lot of unforeseen business events um, in an e-commerce business. So, you know, for, for example, recently, um, Djokovic won the um, Australian Open and then he won Wimbledon. You know, I, I didn't expect that, but that caused a huge spike um, in the companies that actually sponsored him. So very good for us, but rather hard to predict from a technology perspective, but also from a capacity perspective in the warehouses. Um, <clears throat> we then, even though we did have warehouses, we had to invest a lot more. So this is a picture of one of the warehouses. We're investing in a very, very big hub um, in Singapore. That's our Southeast Asia hub. We also have an Asia Pacific hub and a North um, a North Asia hub um, in Hong Kong, uh, but as I mentioned, we have 24 warehouses that then also cover the smaller markets. Um, if I can just summarize what, what is the key thing, what, what has been the key thing for, for us in the transformation. You know, the first thing was, you know, we, we, pilot a lot of, we piloted a lot of business models. You know, you've seen those earlier. There were actually a couple of more, but they were too embarrassing to mention, so I don't want to talk about that. But, um, 
the, the key thing is, you know, don't start planning too long. I've seen a lot of organizations, especially large ones, that spend like a two-year planning process. By, by the time they launch, you know, that the market opportunity is already gone. So make sure we, we, <clears throat> we time box the analysis to a, absolutely a month, not more, to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we don't, we don't overanalyze. Um, and then we go into a pilot phase. So that pilot phase are rather, rather essential. The second thing is focus on your people um, and see that you get the right talent. You know, Singapore Post was not in a position to set up an e-commerce business, they knew that, so better to bring in some fresh guys that actually know what they're doing. Um, but secondly, you know, you can have the nicest surveys or, or market data. Um, if you don't know what your customers want, you know, it's rather challenging. So you, if, if, but you, if, actually, I'm surprised that a lot, not a lot of more people do that. You know, just listen to your customers, and they tell you go to Korea. Um, so listen to your customers and, and, and see <coughs> where you can serve them. And then last but not least, you know, leverage your strengths. If you would have no capabilities, and one thing that I probably underestimated that a postal organization had, you know, we deliver more than three million items every day. You know, in order to do that, um, with a very, very low failure rate, you need to be a, an excellent operator. Um, so that's something that, uh, that we've been really able to leverage um, in a lot of the warehouse operations um, that we run and across the entire organization. So that's all I had. Any questions? Feel free to ask me later on. And we're actually also hiring. So if, just like Chris, sorry, a little more competition. But uh, if you're interested in joining us, um, let me know. <laughs> Thank you.